Welcome everyone to The Chess Angle. Thanks so much for tuning in. Got a good show planned. We have three emails from our listener mailbag, and then I'm going to be discussing my thoughts on online chess, specifically blitz chess and some of those faster time controls, and how I feel about their effect on improvement, whether it's good or bad. I'm going to get into that. I did a little bit of an experiment this summer on chess.com trying different blitz time controls. I'll tell you what I discovered. That's coming up. But first, I want to throw in something that wasn't in my original notes. I'm recording this the day after the club. And one of the members said something to me last night that I think is a very important and very telling occurrence. It's sort of a teachable moment. And so I'm going to interject and insert this into this week's episode. Now, As my fellow tournament directors know, because we do have a number of TDs who listen to this podcast, very often we become a sounding board or really a punching bag, depending on who it is, when somebody loses a game, in particular when a higher rated opponent loses a game to someone much lower rated. And it amazes me that people don't realize how common that is. When a 1,000 player, say, beats a 1,600 or 1,700 player, that happens all the time. People think it's like this wild, anomalous situation. For me, I'm like, yeah, it's Tuesday, right? I mean, (laughs) any TD knows that. These sort of upsets are very common because the truth is at our level, at the amateur level, say, players rated anywhere from unrated all the way up to 2,000, that whole range. Anyone in that range is capable of playing very poorly or very well on any given night. So you could have a 2,000 player who just doesn't play well, who could play almost like a beginner, maybe not quite like a beginner, but who can play at least several hundred points lower. And you could have someone rated 1,000 or 800 who plays several hundred points higher. It happens. These things happen. And why do you think the person who loses that game the higher rated player, why do you think they come to me as the TD? Very simple, because that's human nature. When something bad happens, what do we do? We blame someone else, right? It's the American way, (laughs) right? I'm not going to take responsibility. It's someone else's fault. What happens, not all the time, but every now and then someone will lose a tough game like that and they'll walk up to me. And in some cases, I can already know what they're going to say if I knew the result of the game before. But anyway, they start walking towards me and I'm like, oh boy, here it comes. And They'll make a comment like, you know, Neil, um, you know, this guy was only rated like 1,200, but he was playing really well. Like, what's going on with that? You know, like it's some big conspiracy and I'm in on it or something. And I go, you know, my response is usually, okay, yeah, and, (laughs) you know, it's like, what do you want me to do? You want me to nullify the result? Welcome to modern tournament chess. That's how it is. You have these low rated, you know, 1,000, 1,200 players who on certain nights are playing like monsters. And then again, the higher rated players sometimes do poorly, but that's part of tournament chess. And I understand the frustration, but they say something to me as if I can do something about it or as if like, well, you know, how could it be that he's playing so well at his rating level? And they don't understand that these things happen. I know deep down, they know I can't do anything. They're more or less just venting to me, but still, this is something I deal with. So why do I mention that? Because one of the players says said something to me, excuse me, about a game the previous week that I think, as I said earlier, is a very teachable moment. So here's what happened. He comes up to me, and this is an older gentleman, a veteran player. He's about 82. He's like my idol, by the way. He's 82 years old, comes to the club every week, regardless of the weather, drives himself. And I'm like, you know, this guy is is like my idol. Like when I'm 82, I still want to be doing that myself, playing my club game every week. So I really look up to this guy. He's about a mid 1400 player, maybe high 1400s. I don't have his rating in front of me, but typical class C club player. And and for, you know, for 82 years old, that's a pretty respectable rating. And he's also beaten a number of higher rated players. So he does pretty well. And he goes, I want to tell you about my game last week. My opponent was 2100 and I almost won the game because he was using so much of his time and he almost ran out of time. And the thing was, you know, he was only up two pawns and I thought I could have beat him. 
And I'm like, you know, I, I tell him, I go, you realize being up two pawns is like a very big deal, especially against a, a higher rated player. I go, even being up one pawn is a, a big deal. But I go, if you're up two pawns, that can almost be decisive, assuming that all things are equal. I'm not saying you're down two pawns and you have an initiative or an attack, but if you're down two pawns clean, meaning everything else is equal, you have no compensation for it as far as a mating net, as far as initiative, I go, that's a big deal. I couldn't convince him of this. He's like, yeah, but it was just two pawns. And the reason I'm telling this story, this is a major leak in people's games. I did a previous episode called Stop Dropping Pawns. And the idea was that a lot of players think just being down one pawn or just being down two pawns is no big deal. And often it is. If you're playing a strong opponent and you don't have any compensation for that pawn or those two pawns, that is often decisive. I can't tell you how many games I've won, especially against low-rated players, where they drop a pawn, thoughtlessly, maybe two pawns, but it could even just be one pawn, and I will simply transpose into a winning endgame and grind out that one pawn advantage into a win. I've won tons of games that way. I've also lost games that way where I blundered a pawn against a strong opponent and he grinded me down and ended up winning. Or maybe I was down two pawns. It doesn't happen all the time, but it it does happen. My thinking is if he thinks that being down two pawns is like no big deal, then I'm guessing that other people think that as well. And that is a very dangerous and insidious thought process. If you're down two pawns, against a strong opponent and you have no compensation for it, that's a losing position. That is a very, very big deal. But he didn't seem to think, you know, it it meant anything. Yeah, it was just two pawns, but the rest of my position was good and he was almost out of time. And I'm trying to tell him that against a strong opponent, that two pawn advantage is going to be enough for the win. Uh, Unless they blunder, which they likely won't. And even in time pressure, this 2100 player didn't blunder. So the moral, moral of the story is, you you have to take your material very seriously if you don't have any compensation for it. Because we hear about like initiative and things like that. It's one thing to strategically sacrifice a pawn or even two pawns if it leads to, again, an attack, an initiative, a major positional advantage. Where your positional or tactical advantage, maybe you have an attack, where that is clearly stronger than the material deficit, that's one thing. But if that's not in place, if you're simply down material with no compensation, you're probably going to lose the game. But again, I couldn't convince him of that. And I apparently, you know, it seems to me there's this sort of school of thought out there among some club level players that, well, being down one or two points is no big deal. It's actually a very big deal. And again, this is assuming you have no compensation for it. I think also some players mistakenly think they have an initiative, like they'll say, okay, I'm going to sacrifice this pawn here for an initiative, but there's really no initiative because that really is kind of an advanced concept. And even if you do have the initiative, even if it's sort of correct, like if it's what I call a happy mistake, one where your thinking was wrong, but it turns out that your sacrifice of the pawn was correct anyway, a lot of players won't know how to finish that. So again, being down one or two pawns is a very, very big deal against a strong player. And you don't want to get into a mindset where you think, oh, you know, no big deal. It's just one or two pawns. I can still win the game. You got to be very careful with that type of thinking. So I just thought that was an interesting story. And what we're going to do now, before our main content, we're going to go to our listener mailbag. You've got mail. All right, we've got a cool listener mailbag segment this week. And our first message is from Jason. He writes, hi, Neil, love the show. Amateur's mind is on Chessable. I'm loving it. The Move Trainer format and video is excellent. Also, so great to have it all electronic and easy to use on my phone. Just wanted to pass along. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Jason, I saw that it was on there. Andres Toth does it. I saw the preview video. However, If you recall in a previous episode, I announced that this year, 2024, I was not spending any more money on courses or books 
because I do have a backlog of study material and I'm going to get to that stuff first. I also do have the, obviously, because I talk about it all the time, I do have the original book version of Amateur's Mind and it's all highlighted and marked. I do plan on reading it again, but I'm sure I will get the course as well at some point just because that book is so important. But thanks for pointing it out. I will definitely check it out at some point. But for those of you who are interested, or maybe you're not a book person, you want everything online, yes, The Amateur's Mind is on Chessable. Our next message is from Chef Steve. He says, I hope this email finds you well. My name is Chef Steve, and I'm reaching out to express my appreciation for your podcast and to seek some guidance on a few chess-related queries. A little bit about myself, I'm a chef and the culinary director of five different restaurant concepts. Balancing my demanding career, two kids, one with special needs, and my passion for chess can be challenging, but I manage to carve out one to two hours daily for my favorite game. I also try to attend the Denver Chess Club whenever my schedule allows and occasionally participate in rapid tournaments on Saturdays. I discovered chess in February and have been hooked ever since. I started listening to your podcast in March, and it has been incredibly helpful in guiding my journey from a beginner to an intermediate player. Your recommendations, such as The Amateur's Mind by Jeremy Silman, studying through for a second time, this book has been invaluable. I'm currently working through Silman's complete book of chess strategy. My regular chess routine includes reading for 10 to 15 minutes, solving puzzles for 15 to 20 minutes, and playing rapid games of 15, 10, or 20 minutes. I guess he means 15 minutes with a 10 second increment, or 20 minutes. Anyway, he continues, after my studies, I reward myself with various chess and correspondence games, sometimes squeezing in puzzles during breaks at work. I primarily play the London system, a choice influenced by your podcast. Recently, I've taught myself the Peart's defense, and I'm eager to try it out over the board. I also have the privilege of being coached by NM Jesse Cohen, who has inspired me to coach elementary school chess clubs. My current ratings are over the board, 629 classical, 672 rapid, chess.com, 848 rapid, 1800 puzzles, and on Lee Chess, 1679 correspondence, and 1150 rapid. I use both LeeChess and Chess.com for my studies and games. LeeChess is my go-to for playing and study, while Chess.com offers great lessons and puzzle rush challenges. I have a couple of questions that I hope you might help me with. When do you recommend castling queenside in the London system? I understand it's often a good idea against the King's Indian defense, but there have been times when the computer suggested it and I wasn't sure why. Number two, how can one better navigate the middle game, whether playing the London or another opening? Are there specific tools or resources you would recommend to improve middle game understanding and strategy? I've attached a recent game where I faced some challenges and would appreciate any insights you can provide, either through the podcast or a quick email response. And then he lists two games, and he closes with, Thank you again for your excellent podcast and the wealth of knowledge you share with the chess community. It's truly inspiring and immensely helpful. May you win your next game, Chef Steve. Let me say, Chef Steve, really appreciate the incredibly kind words. And I have to say respect, a lot of respect for you. I have some family members who are in the culinary business, the restaurant business. I know it's extremely demanding. It's long hours. So the fact that you're still able to put in that much study time and participate over the board. That's awesome. I really, really respect that. Plus you're a father. That's not easy to do. So I really salute you for doing that and for your dedication to the game. I'm looking at your current ratings, which makes sense considering that you've just started the game. So I guess you're not one of those people who started playing during the pandemic and then went from like unrated to 2000 in like a year and a half. All right. Well, <laughs> I'll, well, I'll talk more about that later. Like those, those sort of crazy claims, but anyway, all right. So let's look at your two questions. Number one is when do you recommend castling queenside 
in the London system. You say it's often a good idea against the King's Indian defense and that the computer suggested Queenside Castling and you weren't sure why. All right, so basically, I mean, obviously, as with everything, it's position dependent. Usually you're going to castle Queenside if you're basically attacking the King and you're going to do a little bit of a pawn storm with your G pawn and your H pawn. See, what happens is, number one, you have to have control of the center first. You got to make sure that's under control. And again, the London system is usually more about central control than central expansion. Now, in the D4, D5 openings, where black plays an early D5, what usually happens is white's knight is cemented on E5. You don't want to let black get an E5 with his pawn. So what happens is you pop your knight on E5 and you shore up the center. And then once that's locked in, you can then often start a kingside attack with h4 to sometimes g4, and you open files. And so in that case, castling queenside would move your king to the other side so that when you push those kingside pawns, your king won't be vulnerable to attack. It also lets the other rook get closer. So again, I'm, I'm kind of oversimplifying this a little bit, but that's one idea. Now, in the king's Indian... The reason why it's often a good idea, especially that h4, h5 move, is because you're nibbling away at g6. See, when black has that fiend kettled position with the pawns on h7, g6, and f7, what happens is when you move the h pawn, right, Simon Williams, GM Simon Williams calls it Harry, right, Harry the h pawn, here comes Harry. If you listen to a Simon uh, Williams video, that's how he describes it. So when you move Harry the h pawn to use Simon Williams's lingo, what happens is you're nibbling away at g6, because after you go h5, black has to make a decision. And if he goes knight takes h5, your rook on h1, you can then often sack the exchange there and you open up lines and it really gets messy for black. So when you castle queen side, again, both of your rooks are now on the king side. And because your king is out of the way, you don't have to worry about it being open to attack because you've tucked it away on the queen side. And of course, with opposite side castling, right, because we're assuming obviously your black is castled on the king side, when you have opposite side castling, it's basically often a race. It's who's going to get the initiative and who's going to break through first, unless of course, like the queens and some of the heavy pieces get traded, then it doesn't really matter because then you're in an end game. But with the queens and most of the pieces on the board, it's really often who's going to break through first. So when you castle queenside, you want to make sure that it's safe. You want to make sure that black can't get the jump on you and get an initiative before you can. But again, the reason it works against the king's Indian is because that fee and kettled pawn structure is very easy to chip away at. And in some cases, what you'll do is you'll put your queen on d2, and then you'll try to get an e4. Because remember, you have a bishop on f4, and then if your queen is on d2, that forms a battery. You know, so you can attack the king side. I know this sounds a lot in the abstract without the board in front of you, but that's the general idea. Of course, it's all position dependent, but the most important prerequisites that might tell you to castle queen side and attack black's castled king is again, number one, you have firm control of the center. Usually your knight is cemented on e5, sometimes not. It's definitely much easier if black plays an early d5, but you want to have control of the center first. If you attack on the wing on the king side, but the center can open up, you're going to get in trouble. So you got to be aware of that. And you also want to make sure that when you castle on the queen side, that it's safe and that black can't get an initiative. So that's just sort of a basic schematic. That's sort of a dictionary schematic of when it might be appropriate. Now, your second question how to better navigate the middle game. That's really kind of a private lesson type of thing. There's a lot to talk about there, but you're reading the amateur's mind. That's all about the middle game. That should help. You might also want to check out Simple Chess by Michael Steen. Small little book, very, very underrated, but it's excellent for the middle game. Also, another classic is Winning Chess Strategies by Yasser Sirwan. All three of those books talk about the middle game in detail. And you say, how do you navigate it, whether you're playing the London or another opening? I mean, I would say a couple of things. Number one, you want to make sure you're developing your pieces in harmony, that you're simply not moving them off the back rank. 
They should work together to control a square and develop in harmony. And then once your pieces are developed, you should have a clear plan from there, whether it's to control a square or open a file. Like I said, it's kind of hard to talk about in the abstract, but The Amateur's Mind, Simple Chess, Winning Chess Strategies, those are great books for the middle game. All right, and beyond that, like I said, it's really, we're getting into like a private lesson type of thing. It's kind of really hard to discuss that without working with the student, but those are just some general thoughts. I'll put links for those books. Really appreciate your email. So thank you so much, Chef Steve. Our final email is from Nick right here on Long Island. He writes, hey, Neil, I'm a huge fan of the podcast and I've listened to nearly every episode. I'm a fellow amateur player on Long Island and just started going to tournaments for the first time last summer. Something about me you might find interesting. I've competed a couple of times on the NBC TV show, American Ninja Warrior, and did that since before chess. But the funny thing is that I found my mindset has sort of melded between the two. In obstacle course training and competition, if you know anything about rock climbing or gymnastics, Athletes will need to use gym chalk on their hands for particularly hard moves. So there's a psychological thing that happens where not having chalk makes climbers feel less secure on the rock wall, even if they aren't actually going to fall or anything. I've found myself showing up to these chess tournaments and instinctively putting my hands by my pockets to search for chalk to put on for the competition, even though there's no advantage to chalking your hands up before a chess game. I thought this was interesting because it just goes to speak to what you've always said about chess games on the toilet or speed chess between tournament rounds. The brain is wired to think and act a certain way during competition, and if you build habits during casual games, you are going to repeat them during the tournament. One of my past coaches, a superior athlete who now coaches Ninja Warrior Obstacles in a prestigious gym in North Carolina, has used speed chess as a way to prepare for the quick thinking often necessary in a physical obstacle race where strong technique and problem solving is needed, but you still must go fast. I found that just one or two rounds of rapid games can help me figure out where my focus levels are at so I can adjust and dial in as needed before a training session. I think having a physical sport is helpful to my chest too in many ways. I could go on forever, but this message would be too long. Always thanks and H-A-G-D. I'm assuming that means have a good day. But anyway, Nick, really appreciate your email. You have a very interesting story there, very interesting background. But I highlighted a sentence that you said, which is, I think, the biggest takeaway from your email. You said the brain is wired to think and act a certain way during competition. And if you build habits during casual games, you're going to repeat them during the tournament. I think that is so true. You want to emulate tournament conditions as much as possible when you study and when you play online. So that way, when you're actually over the board in competition, it will transfer over. So I think that's very, very well said. So Nick, thanks so much. Great to hear from you. And We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with my discussion of my Blitz Chess experiment this summer and my thoughts about Blitz Chess for improvement. That's coming up right after these messages. Okay, so this summer, I did a little bit of an online chess experiment, and I'm going to be discussing online chess in the context of improvement how online chess can be a positive tool and how it can be a negative tool. And I'm going to throw in some thoughts about online chess in general. Now, one statement up front, I might get some flack for saying this. I might be called cynical, but I'm not buying or I have trouble buying a lot of these stories about these rapid rating increases in just like one year or two years or three years from those who didn't start playing until the pandemic or until they saw the Queen's Gambit. That is, they'll claim their chess.com rapid rating went from like unrated to 1800 in like a year and a half, or went from like zero to 2200 in whatever year and a half or two and a half years or three years, something like that. Very short range. It's hard for me to believe because I see how strong some of the players are on chess.com, even some of the lower rated ones. 
And I notice with some of these players who make those claims, their over the board US chess rating is very low. So it doesn't quite jibe with the online progress that they're claiming. I mean, yes, of course your online rating is going to be higher than your OTB, but I don't know if it should be that much higher. So are there people who legitimately made that jump in a short amount of time? Let's say they went from unrated to like 2,200 in three years. I'm sure there's a few out there, but there seem to be a lot of people making that claim. And I'm just going to leave it as, I'm not, you know, I have a little bit of trouble kind of buying that, having been involved in chess for so many years. So I don't know. I don't know. That's just me. It's out there. It's a little bizarre. So I just kind of wanted to throw that in as sort of a side observation. Now, I did an online chess experiment this summer where I tried different time controls, including ones I'm generally not comfortable with or time controls that I think are like silly. I specifically wanted to experiment with blitz time controls as far as whether they're helpful for improvement, because I think we can all agree that the slower time controls when playing online are generally beneficial and good for training. So we don't really need to discuss those playing like those 15 minute games. I think those slower time controls are generally beneficial. I don't think there's too much disagreement with that. So first, let me give you some context on my current chess.com stats, which I generally don't discuss. My daily rating is 1772. My rapid rating is 1833. My blitz rating, which took a bit of a hit because of this experiment, it kind of jumps around between like the low 1500s and the low 1800s. So sort of a 300 point range where it kind of ping pongs back and forth. Again, it's my blitz rating where I did this experiment. So I did torture a good number of rating points in the process, but I knew that going in. And I didn't mess with my rapid or my daily rating for this experiment. And I feel like a 10-5 game, like 10 minutes with a five-second increment, I feel like that takes forever when staring at a computer. There's something about doing it online and staring at a screen. But those slower rapid controls like 10-5, those are good if you have a large swath of time, if you have large blocks of time for it, which most of us don't. So I didn't really get into that. I don't really play rapid and daily too much anymore. It's been a while. But here's what I discovered with this experiment. And this is just me. This is my own personal story. I don't want to make too many generalizations, although maybe I'm doing that a little bit. But what I found out for myself, there's a bit of a conflict between what I like to play online, what I think is the most fun, and what is actually benefiting me and helping me improve. I like the 5-0 games. Just straight ahead blitz, 5-minute games, no increment, 5-0. They're a lot of fun, but what I found is that 5-5 games are the ones that are really helping me. 5 minutes with a 5-second increment. So basically, 5-5 is my go-to blitz time control for improvement. That 5-second increment is huge. I mean, it's like a different game. And of course, with all of this, you need to review your games afterwards. Very, very important. The other thing I learned, bullet chess, specifically 1-0, one one minute games with no increment, a colossal waste of time. Utterly ridiculous, an absolute waste of time. Now, I played it as part of this experiment because just to, you know, if I'm going to talk about something and criticize it, I can't do it unless I've done it, right? But I mean, what a waste. One o, it's a crapshoot. It's slot machine chess. It's like it's like, like pulling a slot machine. You're just moving pieces and hoping the other guy runs out of time before you do. It has no instructional value, no improvement value. It's chess entertainment. So for improvement, I think it's a colossal waste of time. Now another popular blitz control is three o. That's a bit better, but I'm also going to argue, at least for me, that was also a waste of time as far as instructional value. I didn't really enjoy that at all. It's just not enough time to think. Did not like 3-0. Now, adding those extra two minutes, 5-0 blitz, completely different. So much fun. With a 5-0 game, you can think for a bit. It's it's actually a lot of time. It's, it's deceptive in that way. Like 5-0 is quick, but it's a lot of time at the same time, if you know what I mean. And if you make a mistake in a worse, you still have a fighting chance, right? Because of the time control and there's no increment. 
your opponent might blunder. He might get get into time trouble. So if you kind of make a mistake early on, you can still be in the game. And as far as blitz, this is the most reasonable time control if you're going to play without an increment. But I don't recommend that. For improvement, you should definitely use an increment of at least five seconds. That's why I like the 5-5 game so much. I do feel like it's more like real chess. 5-0 is fun. Don't get me wrong. I love it. But I will say this. The problem with 5-0, it's very, very addicting. Very addicting. And I found myself at times having trouble stopping. Like you just want to do one more game. And I've talked about tilt and disciplining yourself. But I go through it too. If I play without an increment, those 5-0 blitz games, it's like potato chips. So I have to watch myself. And I know I'm always talking about the addictive nature of online chess. And even though 5-0 is technically the most fun, I really do enjoy it. It's very easy to get addicted and to play more games than you plan on doing. So I have to be disciplined about it. And for me, those 5-5 games, they're the best. And what I like about the 5-5 games, there's not an addictive quality to them. I can play just one or two of them, review them, and I get my fill for the day. I don't feel a need to kind of go back on and continue But 5-0 Blitz, you kind of just want to do one after the other. At least that's what I discovered. So basically, 5-5 Blitz, that's my gold standard as far as a Blitz time control that has instructional value. I mean, sure, again, a 10-5 rapid game or like a 15-minute rapid game, that's even better. But again, I just feel like you're sitting in front of the computer forever with those time controls, and it just takes too much time. I don't want to be in front of a screen that long. And for longer games, I would rather save it for my over-the-board tournaments. And with the 5-5 games, it doesn't sound like much on paper, like five minutes with a five-second increment, but because it's an increment where you're gaining time on the clock, those games can go like 15, 20 minutes. So they're actually pretty long. And if you were to start, let's say, a 10-5 game, I mean, that could easily go 25 minutes to a half hour, depending on if it goes into an end game, and if both players are kind of moving quickly and using the increment. So I think 5-5 five, five is that perfect balance. It's my gold standard. And that's what I discovered for me. Your experience might be different. Other people are going to say, you know what? Sorry, Neil, I love 3 L. Like, that's my favorite. Other people are going to say they don't like 5-0 blitz. Other people are going to say they like 5-3 blitz. Other people may say they don't like playing with an increment. This is all subjective, but for me, it's all about 5-5 and definitely using an increment. Now, the only issue I had with 5-5 is at times, it's hard to get a game. So one of the traps I fell into, I would put in for a 5-5 blitz game. It would say searching for opponent, and you probably know where I'm going with this. I would get impatient. Okay, let me me just do one or two 5-0 games, and then I would end up playing like seven or eight games. And in some cases, I wouldn't stop when I should have. Because the other thing I've noticed, and I don't know if this is me or maybe it's my age, although even when I was younger, I found this as well. If I play sort of like one game after the other, like 5 0 games, which I'm not recommending, the problem is you may win the first game, the second game, even the third game. But I noticed by the time you get to that fourth or fifth game, the mistakes just start to happen. So I need to take breaks or stop for the day. I just wanted to share that story and I wanted to discuss my thoughts on blitz time controls for improvement because I know because of time, they can't sit in front of the computer for long periods of time or maybe it's at night before they go to bed. They don't want to spend a lot of time. They'll play without an increment or they'll play blitz just because it's more convenient. I guess what I'm saying is if you're going to play blitz, try to use an increment at a minimum. You know, but what I found for myself, anything less than a base time control of five minutes was kind of a waste. I just wasn't doing well with it, and I felt it had no instructional value. If you have a story about online chess and how it helps you improve, I'd love to hear from you. If enough people reply, maybe I can use that for an entire follow-up episode or part of an episode. But for chess.com, which is my site of choice, The most valuable instructional material, as I've said many times before, are the lessons, right? You go to learn and then lessons, they're outstanding. It's the closest thing you're going to get to, say, a private lesson 
with a JM. I think they're very, very well presented. And if you're going to play Blitz for instructional or improvement value, I would definitely use an increment and not do anything below five minutes. That's what I found for myself. Just wanted to share that. It was an interesting experiment. So if you have any thoughts, as always, I would love to hear from from you. Info at thechessangle.com. If you have any thoughts on this episode, or if you just have any ideas for a future episode on a different topic, any suggestions, because if you're thinking of a topic, other players probably want to hear it as well. As always, really appreciate you listening, and I hope you win your next game. Have a great day, everybody.